does, go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. And we're going to be in verses 14 to 30 this morning. The title of the message is Really Ready. Really Ready. And I believe that that's what the Lord wants from us, to, to live our lives in such a way that we're not just ready, you know, like lip service, yeah, I'm ready, but that we would live as those who are really ready for the day when we see him face to face. I'm just getting set up here. Don't worry about it. It's going to all it's going to be all good. Hey, I was thinking about just stewardship and I think even dedication of a child. What a great example of stewardship, but I was thinking about just stewardship because the section that we're in today focuses on the talents that the Lord has given us, biblical talents, which we'll talk about what exactly that is, but also everything that the Lord has given us and made us responsible in and responsible over. We're gonna talk about the fact that we live our lives in this day. We understand and, and we've understood over the last couple of chapters of Matthew that we, we are looking forward to his return. And his return is coming soon. He says, I am coming quickly. And Jesus said multiple times in 24 and then in chapter 25, verse 13, that we don't know the day, we don't know the hour, so we have to live as those who are prepared. Prepared to see Jesus. And we looked at the parable of the 10 virgins and, and, and the idea that we have to truly have a real relationship with Christ in this life because on that day when he returns, it's too late. In light of that, we're talking about being really ready and Jesus gives us some principles as to how we are to live while we wait. While we wait for his return, while we wait for that day of his coming, how are we to live? What are we to do? And what are you to do with all that God has entrusted and given to you? All of those things matter. There's going to be a, a day of reckoning. We'll talk about it today. All will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for how we lived our lives, what we did with those things that we were responsible in and responsible over. I was reminded of a time when I was in elementary school. And back then, I don't know if they still do it today. Certainly they don't do it this year. But back then, they had these really A-type salespeople who would come in and they would tell us that we, we needed to get excited about selling Christmas gifts to people in our neighborhoods. There was this catalog. It was filled with things like popcorn and all kinds of stuff like that. And so you would go around the neighborhood and you would sell, but the reason why you would sell is because of these rewards that you would get for selling well. And they had these tiers, like at the bottom, you know, it'd be like a yo-yo. And then you go up and it's like, oh, I can get a t-shirt. And then you go up and it's like a Walkman. You don't know what a Walkman is. If you weren't around when I was growing up, that's where you put your, your tape in. What's a tape? I know, seriously, right? So you could get a Walkman, or you could get a boombox, or you could get a bike, or you could get a limo ride for you and all your friends with pizza. That's what I wanted to get. I wanted the limo ride with all my friends with pizza. And so I went around my neighborhood, and I'm telling you, I sold. And then when you went back into the classroom, they had this beaker that they would fill up with, rather, with red marker, as to how well we were doing, and they would go around the room and say, how are you doing? Like, well, I got five sales. Oh, Samuel Wilson doing his thing, right? And then we'd go around, and I'm telling you, I was selling really well. So when they would come around to me, it'd be like five or 10 every day. I went out immediately. I didn't even talk to my mom about it. I'm like, I'm getting that limo ride. Maybe she'll be invited. Maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> but when I get that reward, it's going to be good. So anyway, we're filling up the beaker, filling up the beaker, we put in our orders, and then they bring all of the items to us that we are then to go distribute out to the neighborhood, give them the gifts. We bring back the money, and the teacher will say, you know, do you have the money? Here's the problem. I went out and sold probably over 100 things. I took down about two addresses. 
I didn't have anyone's address. So I had all this stuff that I was given by my teacher. And then I'm going out in the neighborhood. I'm trying to find these hundred houses. And I'm like, I think I sold something to this person. I think the one person I went to their house, I'm like, what exactly did you order? (laughs) What exactly did you order? Here's how much you owe me. I was in fifth grade. Okay, guess what? I couldn't find all those folks. And so the day gets longer and longer. And my teacher comes and says, hey, like you, we gave you all that stuff. Now you got to bring something back in return. And I had to go home and I had to tell my mom that I had totally blown it. And guess what? Most people who are our friends or our family got a gift out of that book that year because mom saved the day. Mom saved the day, but you see on the day when we stand before Christ, it's not going to be about what your mom can do or what your dad can do or what your neighbor can do. It's about what you did. It's about the life that you lived. And we understand that we're in this section of scripture where Jesus is giving illustrations and parables about what his return will be like. This section of scripture, I've, uh, as far as I interpret it, is directed toward those who will be alive at the end of the tribulation period. But this parable applies to anyone who's on earth at any time because Jesus is talking about the way in which we steward, the way in which we uh, uh, live our lives today in response to all that he has given. So if you would, turn with me, if you're not there yet, Matthew 25, verses 14. If you don't have your Bible, it's up there on uh, the overhead. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received five talents went and traded them and made another five talents. And likewise, the one who had received two gained two more. But he who received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came, settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to them, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enjoy the joy of your Lord. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you've not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Look there, have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I've not sown and gather where I've not gathered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back uh, my own with interest. So take the talent from him, give it to the one who has 10 talents. For everyone who has more will be given and and he will have an abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away and cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping, there will be gnashing of teeth. Jesus is highlighting the importance of being ready for his return. So what does he use? He uses a parable. We've talked about what parables are. Parables are where one thing is thrown alongside another thing, and Jesus gives parables masterfully. He uses real examples that people would have seen in their day and throws those alongside spiritual principles or uh, realities in the kingdom. Here he says, the kingdom of heaven is like his coming. The disciples had asked, what are the signs of your coming? And what, when will be the end of the age? And Jesus is saying, this is what it's going to be like when I return. So the parable here, he's talking about something that would have been seen in that day, a very wealthy man who had a lot of uh, things that he was responsible for. 
When he would go on a long journey, he would put his servants in charge of his stuff. So his servants would be in charge of the things that he had. They would be responsible for them. And so Jesus is saying, this man's going on a long journey and these servants were made responsible over them. And he's applying this to a kingdom reality. So the word that I'm going to use to start out for our first point is the word steward. He's talking about a steward. So a steward is a person who manages another person's property. That means that it's not theirs to manage. I mean, I'm sorry, it's theirs to manage, but they don't own it. They're managing someone else's stuff. And so since he's throwing this along, we understand that Jesus is expressing the importance of what the Lord has given and entrusted to us for his purposes and for his glory. It's an important picture for us because what we do with what we've been entrusted today, here and now, has eternal implications. What God's given us, how we do with what God has given us, has eternal implications. And so as we live this life for Christ, what is important is that you see yourself as a steward. You see yourself as a steward, that everything you have, God has given, everything that you, uh, time, I'm gonna talk about this, time, energy, ability, and money, those things have been given from God, we're responsible, and what we do with those have eternal implications. So I wanna talk, first of all, we're, we're talking about these talents being given to the people, and I think it would be easy for us to go, Oh, yeah, just like he gave me the ability to like roll my tongue or, you know, blow saliva bubbles or sing really well. No, that's not what he's talking about. That's not what the picture in view is. Now, I'm going to look at it in light of everything that we've been made responsible, but I think it's important that we first understand what he's talking about. What are talents? Talents is money. Jesus is giving a parable about Talents, money. So the talent was uh, meant a weight. It was a weight of money. And so that would be like either gold or silver or copper. I'm gonna go right down the middle in value. I'm just gonna go with silver. I mean, we could go extreme or we could go low. Let's just stay on the middle. So the value of what this man had given was one talent was about 20 years wages. So... The one with five talents was given a hundred years wages. So whatever you make per year, times it by a hundred, just for the sake of fun, that's, you know, in today's terms, that's what this person was being given. Now, interestingly, this word talent, the word that we use for talent has become to mean abilities in our day. So we understand that over the course of time that has changed into uh, uh, abilities. It, the definition just says at some point in history that changed from money to abilities. And so we understand that. That's the word that, that we use. But we have to also get the picture that Jesus isn't just talking about like double jointed fingers or you know some weird talent that you have. Uh, the disciples, it would have been no mistaking to them that Jesus was talking about an amount of money that was given to them. As I talk about this, I'm gonna be talking about everything that we've been made responsible over and certainly money is a part of that. So to the one with five, uh, about 20 years, uh, I'm sorry, about 100 years wages, the one with two, about 40 years, the one with one, 20 years. So catch this. I think we can look at it and go, oh, well, he only got one. So what does it matter what he does? No, each one, even the one was given a large sum. There was a lot that the one with one was given and made responsible over. And so these talents, they were worth a great deal. But the parable illustrates an example for us about what God has given us. And we know from John 14 that he has gone away to prepare a place for us. So Jesus came, his first coming. We know his death, burial, resurrection. He went away. He's in his father's house preparing a place for us. While he's gone away, we live this life while we wait for his return. And he's entrusted to us time, energy, ability, money. So all that we have been given then is from God. 
Everything that we have is from God. Everything that we've been given is something that God has entrusted to us into our care. And the expectation that we're going to see and talk about in just a little bit of those servants is that those servants would put that with which they were uh, given charge over, they would put it to work. They uh, They would gain, they would multiply it. So what we've been given is from God. And so it's important to see ourselves as stewards. And I think that sometimes when, when we know that something's been given to us, clearly it's like, man, that is from God. And we look at that and we go, man, that's God's. And then we compartmentalize the rest of our life. Like this is mine, one for me. I'm sorry, two for me, one for him. Three for me, one for him. I'll give him Sunday, but you know, six other days, I gotta do my thing. And I think that it's easy sometimes for us to live that way, compartmentalize our lives. But the reality is, is that Romans eleven thirty six 36 says, for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. We say, amen, let it be. That means that all things are, 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 are from him, through him, to him, and what we want to do with those things is bring him glory. I want to bring him glory with what he's entrusted to me, what he's made me responsible for. James 1.17 says, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Every good thing given, every perfect gift, everything that we have, we are all stewards. That means there's nothing that we have that is ours and ours alone. It's a gift given from him. All of these things that we've been talking about. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, you are not your own. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Romans 14, eight, if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. And I looked at this scripture. We're gonna put it up, uh, Psalm 50, 10 to 12. This is the Lord talking. And he says, for every animal of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains and everything that moves in the field is mine, And I like this next verse. If I were hungry, I would not tell you for the world is mine and everything it contains. I love that from the Lord. Like if I were hungry, I wouldn't come talking to you because it's all mine, right? We need him. We're to go to him and say, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Why? Because everything belongs to him. He's like, I wouldn't come and talk to you if I need something. I own it all. I got it all. We go to him from his hand into our hand, and then we use it for his good and for his glory. Some people say, uh, I'm self-made. <laughs> well, I would argue different. You are God-made. He's given you the breath in your lungs. He's given you the ability to think your heart is beating, your blood is pumping, like God is making everything work. Well, I worked really hard for that. Well, God even gave you the ability to think the way that you think so that you can have the things that you have, the job that you have to process information a certain way. I mean, I know people who can process information that there's no way I could process that information. I'm like, how do you even know that? Have you ever talked to like someone who majored in college in physics or something? I'm like, you're on a whole other level. And then they look at something that, you know, you do. And they're like, I could never do that. They just don't think that way. They're able to think that way. God gave us the minds even that we have. Our bodies, the ability to, he gave us the the daily bread that we have. And he gave us the ability to process that daily bread. Like through our body. So that it can be used in our body for nourishment. I mean, God is so amazing. He's given you all that you have. First, I'm sorry, Colossians 1.16, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I mean, that one is pretty clear. He created everything, all things are in him, in him all things hold together. Amen. He holds it all together. And then in Colossians 3, 23 to 24, 
whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord and not for people, knowing that it is from the Lord that you receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. So this week I'm touching on something and next week I'm gonna really go into it. The fact that we're gonna stand before the judgment seat of Christ and at the judgment seat of Christ, there's rewards, there's an inheritance. I'll talk more about it in a little bit, but, but the idea is, is that we live our lives in faithful service to him. We're entrusted many things from him and then we give an account for our life to him when we see him. God has given it all. And with our all, whatever we do, we work heartily as unto the Lord, recognizing that it's all from him. And from him, we will receive a prize. So we have these three servants. One gets five, one gets two, one gets one. And then verse 16, then he who received the five talents went and traded them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who received two, two more. But the one who received one went and dug a hole in the ground and put his Lord's money in the ground. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. There was no question on the part of the servants that, 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 that the master, the Lord, was going to come and settle accounts with them. He was going to return. All were given something, but not all who were given something went and did the same thing. And not all who were given something went and did anything. One did nothing. He just dug a hole in the ground. He buried his talent. He buried what God had given. The others took it and went and traded it and made good on it and multiplied it. And so in recognition of what has been entrusted currently, we need to be those who work heartily as unto him and invest what has been entrusted. Invest in this life what God has entrusted to us not to go bury it, no, to take it, to use it, and to multiply it for him, for his good, for his glory, for his kingdom. We see the importance of uh, this principle is going to be very, very, very important on the day of accountability. Each one did different, but the one who had the five immediately went and did business with them, earned five more, the one, two, two more, the one, one, None. The money was given. Each one did something with it. And here's the thing. The accountability, just like in the parable of the 10 virgins where um, the bridegroom was away for a long time. Here we see that again. He went away for a long time. It was almost as if that one who had buried the one just figured he wouldn't return or it didn't matter to him, but he was gone for a long time. Oh, maybe he won't come back. I know where it's I know where it's buried though. Maybe I can go and get it for myself or something like this. But it says that after a long time, he went, I'm sorry, he came to settle with his servants. They were to take what had been given and get more so that they would be profitable with what had been entrusted. And this is the point that Jesus is getting at in our lives, that day of reckoning, that day of accountability. It may be a long time. It may be longer sometimes than we want it to be. We want Lord Jesus, come quickly. We need you now. We need you to, to, to fix things and write things and, 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 and work them out. We want you on the throne. We want you to rule. We want you to reign. We want the government to rest on your shoulders. I mean, we want that to happen and we want it to happen now. But the idea is that after a long time, after a good long life that you live, hopefully there's going to be accountability. And if he returns or, or we're caught up to be with him before that, it may still feel like a long time. But the picture is, is that he's still going to hold us accountable. He's gonna hold us accountable to the way that we lived. And like I said earlier, on that day, it's not going to be what neighbor, mother, father, grandfather did. It's going to be what did you do with what God gave you? You stand before the judgment seat, the bema seat of Christ, you stand before him. He's going to say, what did you do? What did you do with what I entrusted you? 
well, you know, you gave that one five and you only gave me one. And we don't know what kind of excuses maybe some people have or what this one was, oh, he only gave me one. It doesn't matter anyway. I'm gonna go bury it in the ground. No, each one was entrusted something and they were to do something with that something. In many areas of our lives, we understand the principle of investing. We understand the principle of taking what we have and getting more with what we have. We want that, right? Like, I hope that, you know, if you're around my age, you're saving for retirement. If you've been retired, you had to save for retirement. Like you're investing, you're doing more so that on that day, you can have something. And so this principle of investing is what we're looking at where God's saying, invest into my kingdom because on that day, there will be something for you if you do. If on that day, you don't live your life for me, uh, do you really know him? I mean, do we really know him? We invest what we've been entrusted. And when we invest what we've been entrusted, whatever we invest in, our heart, our interest, it follows. Jesus already talked about this. Matthew 6, 20 to 21, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Also, what does that mean? That means our heart follows our treasure. What do you treasure? What do you treasure in this life? Your heart follows that. Your heart follows it. And so in the lives that we live, we have to understand that earthly treasures will pass away. He's saying, Don't uh, put your treasures in places where moth and rust destroy, where thieves can break in and steal it. No, store for yourselves treasures in heaven. And if you're living for the treasures of this earth, if that's the purpose of your life, then you're living for the wrong purpose. Jesus is saying, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Your heart follows your treasure. I remember when um, my dad, he had gotten this brand new, I mean, this thing was so nice. It was a Mustang GT 2007, grabber orange, chromed out wheels. I mean, the whole nine yards. He had it for six months. And then he goes, Samuel, do you want to borrow my car for a while? (laughs) Do I? And so I got this, I mean, this thing was really, really nice. I get this GT and I'm driving it around. And he was going to let me drive it for like an extended period of time. But you know what's interesting is that everywhere that I took that car, If I went out to dinner, if I went over to a friend's house, what was on my mind? That car. Like what was happening with that car? Did someone put a door ding in it? You know, like I I couldn't get it off of my mind. What was I treasuring at that point? That car, right? Like that car became my treasure. My heart was following it and it didn't matter where I went. It was on my mind. Now, I'm not saying this in terms of like, it's wrong to possess things. I'm just saying that it's wrong to let possessions possess you. When possess, possessions are what possesses you, God's saying, no, I wanna be your God. I wanna be your Lord. And he understands that our heart follows our treasure. Matthew six twenty four. no one can serve two masters for either they hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. No one can serve two masters. We can't serve money and God. No, we serve God and then everything that he entrusts to us, we say, Lord, what do you want me to do with that? Jesus is highlighting the impossibility of serving both. Essentially, our treasure is either in heaven or it's on earth. And you can tell what or who you are serving by realizing what you are willing to sacrifice for. What are you willing to sacrifice for? That will tell you what or who you are serving. Many are willing to sacrifice everything for wealth. Many are willing to to give all of their time. I mean, everything so that they could have wealth. But do not sacrifice for the sake of Jesus. Aren't willing to sacrifice in that way. There's this uh, writer, this famous doctor, Martin Lord Jones. He tells a story, and I want to tell you the story today of a farmer who went happily and with great joy in his heart to report to their wife that his uh, favorite best cow had given birth to two calves, 
a red one and a white one. And so this cow had given birth to the two calves and he, he goes to his wife with this great joy and great joy in his heart. And he says to his wife, I am so excited about these two cows that I'm actually going to raise these calves and then I'm gonna give one to the Lord. And she said, which one are you gonna give to the Lord? He said, oh, that's not important right now. Let me just raise them and then I will determine whether it's the white one or the red one. In a few months, the man came back to his wife looking miserable, unhappy, and he says, honey, I have bad news to tell you. She says, what is it? He said, the, the Lord's calf is dead. And she said, wait a minute, I thought you didn't decide on which calf was the Lord's. And he goes, oh, I always knew it was the white one. It was the white one that I was going to give to the Lord. And now the white one's dead. So sorry, Lord. Isn't that so true sometimes of the way that we live? When we lose something or when we have to cut something, the first thing that gets cut off is our contribution to God's kingdom or our service to, oh, I, 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 I'm short on time. So I'm gonna do all of these other things, serve all these other things, but we're not doing the things that the Lord has for us. Martin Lloyd joins, Martin Lloyd, say that 10 times fast. Martin Lloyd Jones says, for most people, it's always the Lord's calf that dies. But that's not the way that we're to live because we have to understand that we're going to give an accounting to the Lord. We cannot serve God and mammon. And so we go before the Lord and we say, how do you want me to live while I wait? How do you want me to live with what you give while I wait? Because I know that I'm gonna stand before you. I know that I'm gonna give an account for the life that I live. And the truth is that we can live our lives today with eternity in view. And that doesn't mean that God's not going to give us what we need. That doesn't mean that we can't have some things in this life. That just means that our lives are, just like we dedicated Caleb today, our lives are devoted. We don't just dedicate our kids. We dedicate our lives to him. And we say, Lord, you do whatever you want to do and you show me what you want for me to do. And that is what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do with my life. 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19 says, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which, uh, of that which is life indeed. We build on that foundation. 1 Corinthians 3 talks about the foundation of Christ that we build upon with uh, gold and silver and precious stones. And we're gonna talk about the fact that when we stand before Christ, those good works, what we do with our time, energy, and ability and money, those things, we stand before Christ and everything that, that we do that's not of gold or silver or those precious stones, they're gonna be burnt up. He's gonna say, what did you do with the life that I've given you? And so we have to understand that in this life, we've been given all kinds of things and that the Lord has provided those things. And in the midst of his provision in those things, we entrust them to him, but we also trust him that he's gonna give us what we need. But we can't just say, the Lord's calf died, so let me go on with my life. Know that treasures in heaven are not susceptible to decay or moth or moths or, or thieves. They are of eternal value. Hebrews 6.10, for God is not uh, so unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown towards his name in having ministered and, is, and, and in minist still ministering to the saints. We talked about it earlier. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as to the Lord, knowing that you will receive a reward from him. 1 Peter 4, 10 to 11, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks 
as one who speaks the oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. Invest what God has given because 2 Corinthians 5, 10 says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We must all give an account for the life that we live and the way that we lived it so that each one may receive compensation for his deeds done through the body in accordance with what he has done, whether good or whether bad. Romans 14, 10, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And it's so easy to look to the left or look to the right. You know, what is that person doing or what is that other person doing? You know, I remember in college, I had this friend all the time, man. And I I was trying to follow the Lord. I still had a lot to figure out, but I was trying to follow the Lord. And he said to me all the time, like, lighten up, man. Like, lighten up. You gotta, you know, you gotta like loosen up a bit. I mean, I guess I was, he thought I was real stiff. I don't know. Must have. You gotta let your guard down sometimes. You don't go hang out, party a bit. I'm like, man, you're accountable for you. But when the Lord says that this is what I'm supposed to do, I'm not going to judge my brother or look to my brother. I'm going to say, Lord, how do you want me to live? And what do you want me to do? Because when I stand before Christ, he's not going to say, what did your best friend do? He's going to say, what did you do? And I think so easily we can get caught up in that in our lives. And I would be doing you a disservice if I did not give a message like this to you today. And you know, it's in God's word, right? We're just going through God's word. But in God's word, what does he tell us that we're gonna be accountable for the way that we live and what we did with what he had given? First Corinthians nine, Paul says, run the race so that you may obtain the prize. Run that you may obtain that prize. And we'll talk more about rewards. Randy talked about them on Thursday night. If you want to uh, look at the, the prophecy class that he's been doing. But, but even though we're going to look at that next week, it's important to understand the picture that Jesus is, paint, is painting is that it's not just what people did with what he had given. It's what they didn't do with what he had given. I mean, there's a lot that we can do with what he has given, but there's a lot that we also don't do. And we can go and we can bury it. And this one did nothing for the, the Lord really with what he had been entrusted. And the worst thing that you could do with what God has given is nothing. I mean, that's the picture that I see. We don't know the backstory of the three servants. We don't know what their risk tolerance was. <laughs> we don't know if the, the third servant had, you know, some trouble financially and now he's given this these talents and he just thinks he's going to blow it but we're called to walk by faith not by sight we're called to invest in God's kingdom and Jesus wants us to clearly see that we are to go with what he gives we are to use what he gives for his good and for his glory and so in this life until he returns choose faithfulness Choose faithfulness with everything that he's entrusted to you. Everything that you've been made responsible for, everything that you have accountability over. He says that the one who had received the five, when he came to hold them to account, what did he say? He said, I've earned five more. I've gained five more talents. And his Lord said this, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things, I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And the one who received two, Lord, you gave me two. Look, I gained two more besides them. His Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Catch this. Both the one with five and the one with two lived faithfully. How does the Lord respond? They get the same response. Well done, good and faithful servant. I'm going to put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Now, this is talking about that that joy when Jesus rules and reigns on earth in person, they go into the joy. But we know that in God's presence, there is fullness of joy so that when we breathe our last here, we go into his joy if we live our lives for him. The two lived faithfully, the third lived fearfully. The one with the one came out, he said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man. 
reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid. I went and hid your talent, buried it in the ground. I don't know, I kind of get this picture here. It says, he says, look there, have what is yours. Like, look there, have what is yours. There it is over there. I mean, the picture that you get from this third servant is that he didn't really know the Lord. He says, this is what I've known you to be. I've known you to be a, a hard, you know, hard, brutal man reaping where you've not sown, gathering where you've not scattered seed. And I was afraid. He didn't know the Lord. He didn't really know his master. Because when you know the master, when you know Jesus, you know scriptures like Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30, where he says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest because my yoke is easy. My uh, burden is light. He says, I'm humble in heart. And when you come to me, you'll find rest for your souls. Man, there are some out there that have all these misconceptions about God. But the reality is, is when we have misconceptions about God, we don't really know God. We don't really understand. But when we know God, we understand that his yoke is easy, that his burden is light. And it's our joy to live faithfully. God loves a cheerful giver. I mean, it's our joy to do that. It's our joy to serve him. It's our joy to use all that he is in, uh, has entrusted to him. His master responded, did you really know that I don't reap? I'm sorry, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I don't scatter seed? I mean, he's asking him a question. Is that what you knew of me? Well, if that's what you knew of me, then you should have known what I would want you to do with what I had entrusted. In reality, he didn't know the man. but The other two who did, what did he say? He said, well done, good and faithful servant. Do you have a desire to hear that when you stand before the Lord? Because I sure do. I mean, I want want to stand before the Lord and him say, well done. Well done, you ran the race. Well done, Samuel. I mean, there's all kinds of things, you know, like I talked to you earlier about like the limo ride, right? Like I'll do anything for a limo ride, but you know, this is well done. I mean, that should be the longing of our heart as we wait for his return. Well done. This is well done, good and faithful servant. Psalm 1611, you will show me the path of life In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. At your right hand. I'm gonna quote this again next week. You wanna know why? Because we're gonna talk about the judgment seat of Christ where the the sheep, his sheep are separated from the goats. And his sheep are at his right hand. His right hand, at your right hand, there are pleasures evermore. He says, enter into joy. There's fullness of joy. You know, in this life, we have to choose joy. I was reminded in thinking about that of uh, our, our Jean Grass and Carol Grass and Anna and Paul Grass, Paul's sister and Jean and Carol's daughter, Peggy Wilkinson. She passed away in 2015 from a, a, a very hard fight with cancer. And from our perspective, she was taken too soon. But in her last year of her life, she wrote this blog, choose joy each day. Choose joy each day. And you know what? Now she's in the presence of the Lord, fullness of joy. She doesn't have to choose. That's just what God has made. That's just what God has given. And I look forward to being where she is in the fullness of his joy, but in 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 in. In the meantime, we have to choose joy and we have to choose him. Charles Spurgeon once said, he didn't say, well done, thou good and brilliant servant. He didn't say, well done, thou good and distinguished servant. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, let a man regard us in this manner, ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it's required of stewards that one be found 
faithful. That word used there for minister is huperetes. It's translated under oarsman or under rower. Those stewards, the, the, the ministers, those people who serve the Lord, we are stewards, we are under rowers. That means that the captain of the ship is up on the top deck and he's saying, go here, go there, row harder, row softer. And he's gonna get us to where we go. We just have to follow our captain, Jesus, our captain, our soul's trusted Lord. Are we completely his? Do our lives belong to him? I mean, because the reality is that if we can't live in such a way where we truly belong to him, and we're seeing these words and we're still not willing, it's like, who is your God? Who is your Lord? And if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, then we understand that's a lifelong process. That's a lifelong process of learning more and more. God, what do you want from me? How can I use what you've entrusted to me? How, how can I steward well? I mean, you know, it's on my mind, obviously, because, you know, you dedicate a child. But every time I see some gift or skill with my own son, I'm going, Lord, you put me as steward over him. Man, I want to do well with that. God, you've blessed me with time and energy and ability and money. Lord, what do you want me to do with that? How can I live for you? What does it mean to be a minister? What does it mean to be a steward? What does it mean to be a servant? It doesn't mean that we get to set our own pace and set our own course. It means we're going, Captain, what are we doing today? And that everything that we have, everything that we've been afforded gets processed through him. Lord, what do you want me to do with what you have entrusted? In the book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis says this, wrote this, every faculty you have, your power of thinking or moving your limbs from moment to moment is given to you by God. If you devoted every moment of your whole life exclusively to his service, you could not give him anything that was not already his. All things are by, through, and to him. So the big question that we have as we come to the conclusion this morning is, what are you doing with what God has given you? And is it in accordance with what he wants you to do with what he's given you? In other words, are you being faithful to him with what he's given? God sees it all. And I encourage you today to respond to him in recognition that everything that we have is his. And as we think over our lives, we process over our lives, we process over the fact that we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We have the opportunity today if, man, maybe you went and you buried something a long time ago, or maybe you said, man, I lost it all. You have the opportunity today to say, I'm gonna be faithful with these little things. Whatever it is that I have, I'm gonna be faithful with. And if you've gone and you've buried your treasure, you've buried your, 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 your talents, so to speak, you have the opportunity today to go dig it up and say, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Because I've been trying to steer the ship. But I realize that you're the captain. And I wanna live my life in such a way that I'm not only ready, but I'm really ready. I'm really ready. So that on that day, the words that we will hear from our Lord is well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful in this life. You were faithful with what I gave. And I'm gonna put you in charge of more. And whatever that more he's gonna put us in charge of, that's up to him. But man, I trust him in it. And I wanna hear those words. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Are we living in light of the eternal reality? Or is it just all about what's going on in the here and now? Because we know clearly 
this world's not where it's at. 